we all realize and acknowledge that we are way off track and we need to come together and add new momentum to the implementation of these goals. Welcome to a special edition of the Global Dispatches podcast. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. And this week, we are bringing you daily updates from the United Nations General Assembly. Global Dispatches has partnered with the United Nations Foundation for a week-long series to bring you news and insights from UNGA 78. Today is Monday, September 18th, the kickoff to what is known around the UN as High Level Week. The main event today was the Sustainable Development Goals Summit. The SDGs were adopted in 2015 with a target date of 2030. This means we are officially at the halfway point, but the SDGs are way off track. COVID had a particularly deleterious impact on progress towards those goals. So, this summit today was intended to revive progress. In the words of Antonio Guterres, in his opening remarks today, quote, The world needs an SDG rescue plan. We will be discussing the SDG event with Navid Hanif, Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs at the United Nations. That will be our second segment today. To kick off and set the stage for all of High Level Week, I am pleased to speak with Elizabeth Cousins, President and CEO of the United Nations Foundation. We discuss some of the key stories that will drive the diplomatic agenda during the 78th United Nations General Assembly and preview some of the major events and happenings throughout the week. Our conversation is your vital UNGA scene setter, so let's jump right into it. Here is my conversation with Elizabeth Cousins, President and CEO of the United Nations Foundation. So before we get into some of the key stories and events you'll be following closely this year, I was hoping you might step back a little bit and set what you perceive to be the broader diplomatic or geopolitical context in which this UNGA is taking place. Leaders are coming to the UN this year at a time of unprecedented turmoil and challenge in the world. That's no secret. So many countries are facing overwhelming and overlapping challenges, whether it's climate change, debt, natural or man-made disasters. We've got geopolitical tensions rising. We're dealing with the hottest years on record and the accelerating impacts of climate. You can't turn a corner without someone being either excited or terrified about AI. You know, People are just facing so many challenges in so many places. So the global agenda is fierce in a wholly new way. And I think you will see all of that on display next week. What I hope we're going to see also is leaders showing up and really recognizing the severity of our situation, also the opportunities to change it and stepping up with some new urgency and frankly, just willingness to roll up their sleeves together on some of these really, really tough challenges. So many of these tough challenges, as you described, will very much be discussed and debated among world leaders and diplomats at UNGA this year. What are some of the key events and key storylines that you are following most closely? Well, the Secretary General is, first of all, starting off his UNGA week, not with member states, but with civil society on Saturday. So I'm really thrilled that that's the case. Just to let you know, this is the first year since COVID that thousands of people are coming to the UN. I got my press pass this year for the first time since COVID. Excellent. They're letting people in the building. They are letting thousands of people in the building. There are over 5,000 people registered. So I think we're going to see a renewal of that kind of dynamism and diversity that we missed during the last few years when it just wasn't possible for people to gather in this way. So looking very forward to that throughout the week. But the big moments start on Monday with SDG Halftime Summit. This is halfway through the countdown to 2030 of the Sustainable Development Goals. We know we're wildly off track on the goals. 
We also know what it will take to get back on track. So this is an opportunity for leaders to come to the table, show that they recognize that and that they're prepared to start to do the hard work of what they need to do to get us back on course, whether that's on education, on health, on poverty, on climate, decent jobs, you name it. These goals, keep in mind, are the goals that were agreed in the most inclusive negotiating process in UN history several years ago. So they're about the real issues that matter to real people in real places. So that's how we start the week. Tuesday is, of course, the opening of the general debate when a phalanx of world leaders start to make their case on the world stage about what they care most about and why. That will be a day to watch. We have a climate ambition summit being hosted by the Secretary General midweek. Again, we know we're off track, even though we're moving in the right direction most of the time in most or at least some places. We need to be going much faster, and much farther. He set a very high bar for that summit. So whether you're a country or a company, you only get on stage if you're actually doing a really good job. So if you can credibly show you're aligned with that one and a half degree goal, you get to show up at that summit. Otherwise, you're shown the door. So, I mean, it's a really strong statement that he's making with that summit about what we need to see and who we need to see it from. We have several high level events on global health throughout the week on pandemic preparedness, TB and universal health care. And I actually was reflecting, I think this is the first UNGA in certainly in recent memory where there is an agenda that really puts people and planet at the center of the week. So not just in the side events, but at the center. And so that to me is quite a powerful reflection of this moment that we're in. And then across the board, I just say, I hope we really will see a whole new level of urgency from leaders in every meeting they have, because it's not just the SDGs that are off track or climate action that's not going as fast as we need it to. Multilateralism is kind of off kilter and we really need it more than ever. So I think we're hearing from people around the world how much that is true, how much they need to see leaders, again, show up and step up. And I hope we will see from many of them, at least the start of renewed recognition, that they need to do better at that most essential task globally, which is working together across borders to solve some of our common challenges. This is, I think, my 17th UNGA in 18 years. And it is indeed, I think, notable that there are three major events on global health all packed in to one UNGA week. I can't really remember that happening in the past. Your point about the SDG summit, I think, is is interesting. So at the pre-UNGA press conference by Antonio Guterres, he sort of telegraphed that he believed there to be a real opportunity for countries to make what he said a quantum leap in achieving the sustainable development goals after years of stalled progress following COVID. You know, to me, Guterres is not like the perennial optimist. He can go doom and gloom when he wants to, particularly talking about climate. So it's interesting to me that he struck this very, I think, optimistic note about what to expect from this SDG summit. Is there anything in particular on that that you're looking towards? I'm thrilled to hear that. I'm also dying to know which of the last 18 UNGAs you missed. It was the big one. It was 2015, the year of the Sustainable Development Goals, also the year that my second child, my son, was born in September. So couldn't miss that. That's a very good reason. And the goals are for your children, right? There you go. Exactly. I think there is reason to be both clear-eyed, we are off track, but also to have not just optimism, but insistence that we get back on track. Every single goal has a pathway to achievement. So that's just factual. You can chart a credible path to achievement of virtually every goal and target in that agenda. What's it going to take to do that? Well, it's going to take more money. We know that that's certainly true. But let me just give you some perspective. So there's an estimated SDG investment gap of $4 trillion. That sounds like a ginormous amount of money. And it is a lot. But put it in perspective, last year, global military spending was over half that. And global spending last year on health and food was over $9 trillion. So we actually already spend the money on the things that the SDGs are about. The question is just whether we spend it in the right ways and in an equitable way to drive kind of larger progress. So there's huge opportunity to advance the goals. Some policy changes are needed. We need more leadership. That's all true. 
But we have the possibility to get all of these goals back on track and to do that for people, particularly in the most vulnerable situations and communities. So I'm glad he sounded that note. I think that's exactly what we need to hear from leaders. And I'm hoping that's the charge they understand themselves to have been given by all their citizens around the world who were part of getting us these goals in the first place and who really deserve that from their leaders and governments. So by the end of High Level Week, are there any concrete outcomes you'll be watching for that, you know, might suggest to you whether or not UNGA, you know, move the needle in the right direction on all of these many issues that you just described? I do think we're going to see some really strong commitments come out of the SDG Summit. I'm hoping we'll see something analogous out of the Climate Ambition Summit later in the week, and certainly from some of the health events you mentioned. There's also a high-level session on financing where I think we'll see the next turn of the wheel on all of the work that's been underway now for some months on important reforms to the work of the international financial institutions, on debt, on liquidity, I think that's all going to be work that you see. Hopefully we will see some significant next steps in all of those areas. But I'd also go back to this point about how many other people and sectors and leaders of a variety of kinds and ages are showing up next week, because some of the action that we're going to see is going to be there. So, you know, the weekend before everything officially starts, it's something that's being labeled the SDG Action Weekend. And on Sunday, a series of what are being called high impact initiatives are being launched that day to drive broader progress across the goals. And they're cross-sectoral. So there are some that are about broader food systems change, about energy systems. There are impact initiatives on data. We're very close to one of them, our Global Partnership on Sustainable Development Data, which is an initiative that is housed at the UN Foundation, is working with the UN, the World Bank, a number of heads of state to launch a major initiative to generate more investment in the data that needs to drive SDG progress. We know how much data matters to everything in our lives, to our economies, our health, our well-being. And there's been some great research showing that for every dollar invested in data, and of course, good quality data and fairly acquired data, it generates $32 in added value. So there's huge gains that you can reap by directing more investment in that area. So a lot of the things we're going to see next week in the advances are going to come from efforts like that. You know, Last year, only 12% of the leaders who showed up were women. And I don't expect we're gonna do that much better this year. We really need progress on that front. So I think one theme you will hear next week, and I hope you'll hear it from some leaders. I am sure you will hear it from civil society. And I'm positive you will also hear it from some UN leaders as well is that we have to do dramatically better on gender equality. We can just not be failing half the world's population the way to date we really still are, whether it's in matters of political representation or legislation that's fair and not discriminatory, or frankly, getting better at our extremely stagnated progress on maternal mortality. So I really hope we see visible attention to the various ways that we have gender gaps (laughs) in the world and on the international stage. So you hinted at this earlier, but it seems that one of like the key undercurrents of this anga is strengthening multilateralism itself. And those conversations are often happening in the context of preparing for the summit of the future. Can you just explain what that is and why it is a key focus this year? So the Summit of the Future is planned for next September. This was something called for by the Secretary General over a year ago, and work has already begun toward making that summit something quite meaningful. It really is the opportunity for world leaders and everyone who has a stake in cooperation to think about how we need to reinvent multilateral cooperation for a healthier, better, and fairer future. So there are some big issues that are already clearly on the agenda to be tackled, like the need to think much more about kind of broader governance and collaboration around digital cooperation. There's a whole track of work around how to recommit to the UN's founding purpose for peace. So this idea of protecting future generations from the scourge of war through something called a new agenda for peace. There's a whole agenda around how to modernize the UN as a system that can truly think, plan, and act for the future and for future generations. To modernize how it does its work, 
to draw on the kind of analytic tools that are available, both technologically and otherwise, to really be able to think toward the horizon and what they need to do as an institution to deliver better for the people in the countries that, that rely on them. You know, the UN Foundation actually does a lot of work with young people around the world to try to give them more opportunities for leadership and influence in multilateral decision making. And they routinely demand and look to the UN to be better able to serve their needs and not just their needs, but the needs of future generations. So next year's summit is an opportunity to really think about what kind of UN we need for the future and how to build it, how to build it institutionally, how to build it technologically, and how to build it politically. It won't get finished there, but it will get started there. And that's a really important conversation to be having. And it seems because this is such a focus of the UN for next year's summit that we're already laying the groundwork this year at UNGA for that. That's absolutely right. And remember, of course, the UN was created in 1945 out of the ashes of the Second World War and around a coalition of countries that have changed dramatically since that time. So that coalition has evolved. There are now 193 countries in the world. And so we need a UN system that really fully reflects the needs, interests of that full diversity of countries and of citizens around the world who really expect it to deliver for we the peoples, of course, the starting words of the UN Charter. So having covered the UN for so long, I've come to understand UNGA as existing along almost like a continuum of diplomacy and diplomatic initiatives. Like meetings at UNGA are intended to build momentum for the next meeting down the road. So what are some of the key big multilateral moments after UNGA? You're absolutely right. I mean, the global agenda that we face It's fierce, it's constant, it's daily. So every multilateral moment needs to be used to take action, to get us further along, to ratchet toward the next one. So next one's coming up almost immediately, actually, in October is the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank Group, which is going to be held in Marrakesh in Morocco. That's the next big opportunity, especially to take forward some of these proposals around international financial institutional reform, around debt around financing. Not long after that is the next Conference of Parties on Climate, the COP28 that is being held in the United Arab Emirates. That's a really important moment on the climate calendar to be able to take stock of where we are and then really work together about where we need to be with greater ambition. And so every single moment on the multilateral calendar is an opportunity for greater ambition and cooperation and for really pushing ourselves, for us pushing our leaders and for them pushing each other to do better uh, around these really giant issues. Throughout the week this week, is there any single individual, a leader or otherwise sort of prominent person that you will be keeping a particularly close eye on? I asked you this question last year and you gave a great answer, which turned out to be extremely perceptive, which was Mia Motley. Well, I'll watch for her anytime. (laughs) Of course. I would say this year, listen to as many of them as you can, because you may find unexpected insight, courage, challenge in ways that will be important to have heard from countries large and small. So I really would encourage that. I also really look not just to the world leaders, but to the other leaders that are showing up. I will say I am spending a lot of my week with young people, and I expect to be inspired and energized by every single one of those conversations, because without fault, I don't ever leave a session in dialogue with a young person or just listening and learning from them where I don't get a new idea, a new perspective, or just genuinely new energy about what's possible in the world. So I'm going to be looking to a lot of those people myself. Thank you so much for your time, Elizabeth, and good luck this week. Thank you. You too. Look forward to seeing you across a crowded room. Big thank you to Elizabeth Cousins. That was a very helpful scene setter. Now let's turn to my conversation with United Nations Assistant Secretary General Navid Hanif and we caught up right in the middle of the SDG Summit. (music) 
So before we discuss what happened at the SDG Summit today, can you explain why this event is being held in the first place? In 2015, we adopted 17 Sustainable Development Goals, but the primary purpose was to ensure no one is left behind, and we also take actions to save our Earth, which is shaken by climate change and the related disasters. And there was agreement that every four years they will come back and review the implementation of these Sustainable Development Goals. So this is the second such summit that has been convened today. And we all realize and acknowledge that we are way off track and we need to come together and add new momentum to the implementation of these goals. That is the primary objective of the summit that started today in New York. The event kicked off with the adoption of a political declaration on the SDGs that had been under negotiation for some time now. What does this declaration say, and why is it significant for the SDGs to have this kind of political declaration? I would like to request you to look at the summit larger than the outcome document. Just this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, It was called the SDG Action Weekend. Saturday was all about mobilizing youth, civil society, academia, scientists, activists from all over the world, local authorities, local governments, to come together and present their proposals how to move forward because we have so far implemented only 15% of the targets. Sunday was high impact initiatives. We brought together member states, the UN system, and key private sector stakeholders to focus on areas like energy transition, food systems, data for the SDGs. So these 12 high-impact initiatives have given new momentum to the areas which require immediate action, including empowerment of women, gender equality. Now, the summit itself, it's a gathering of leaders and stakeholders. The outcome document which was adopted this morning, first and foremost, there is a clear recognition by all leaders. We are way off track. We need to recognize these gaps, shortfalls, and we need to come together to act. What does that action mean? You know, all global commitments first and foremost require national actions. So there is a commitment to re-energize national level implementation and come up with ambitious plans on poverty eradication, on inequality. But also there's a commitment for global actions. One factor which is repeatedly mentioned by developing countries is lack of means of implementation. And let me identify those for you and also mention what the declaration states in advancing action in these areas. First and foremost is the financing challenge. COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, and climate change related disasters, they have diverted resources from the SDGs. Countries are facing serious fiscal challenges. Their budgets do not have space or resources to invest in the SDGs. Estimates indicate there is a $4.5 to $5 trillion needed that should be invested in sustainable development goals every year until 2030. We are way below that. So there is a commitment to mobilize financing, to help a large number of countries to fill the financing gap. How? The Secretary General in February this year proposed SDG stimulus. It is meant to advance actions in three areas. First and foremost, address the debt distress, the debt challenges of sovereigns. As of now, 3.3 billion people are living in countries who spend more on servicing their debt than investing in education or health, and that is half of humanity. Over 60 countries are facing the risk of debt distress. So the SDG stimulus by the Secretary General is meant to advance solutions for immediate relief and then long-term solutions for reducing their debt stocks. Can I ask you on that stimulus, which has been, as you said, a key focus of Antonio Guterres, I think the figure he put was $500 billion a year. 
have you seen momentum towards mobilizing that stimulus? And is there any direct reference to that stimulus in the political declaration? That is the second part of the stimulus. Debt distress is the first second. And let me emphasize, the proposal is to mobilize $500 billion a year and taking them to $1 trillion until 2030 through gradual increases. But this money is going to come from massive changes in the multilateral development banks like the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, and a number of development banks that are operated nationally. But I will focus on global development banks. How do we generate $500 billion a year to make available to developing countries an affordable and long term? I want to emphasize money is available, but it is too expensive to access. Mm -hmm. It should be affordable on low interest rates and maturity time 30 to 50 years. And you saw Mia Motley at the SDG summit this morning say exactly that, that you know, Mia Motley is the president or prime minister of Barbados, a key and very prominent advocate for development financing. You know, we need longer loans and cheaper loans in order to achieve the SDGs. And, you know, thus far, we haven't seen the international financial institutions, you know, do that just yet. And so it does seem that one outcome, as you just identified, is putting on the map this idea of like longer time horizons and cheaper loans, which, you know, if implemented, would be rather significant. Yes. And let me tell you, first of all, the summit has endorsed it. So that's a major breakthrough today. What is happening? And I must also acknowledge the development banks are already working on this. And let me mention two things that the World Bank is doing. World Bank has started, it's called an evolution roadmap. How will it do two things? First and foremost, innovative instruments to make this money available to developing countries. They can invest in the sustainable development goals and fight climate change. Also, which is significant, World Bank will try to mobilize private capital. And the effort is leveraging. Each dollar that World Bank provides leads to $5 from the private sector that are invested in energy transformation, infrastructure, in connecting people, 2.6 billion who are still out of internet access, giving them access in data, in capacity building. So World Bank and a number of other multilateral development banks are already starting to change their operations, optimize their balance sheet, come up with new instruments, to make this money available. For instance, bank has already announced $50 billion over the next 10 years, $5 billion every year they will increase in lending. This is just a starting point. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it was also notable, I'd say on stage, that Mia Motley pointed to A.J. Benga, the president of the World Bank, and said, you know, I, I presume this is a compliment using cricket, but that you scored a century in your first 100 days in office, which is notable coming from Mia Motley, who has been a, a really sharp critic in the past of the World Bank and the IMF. So it seems, as you noted, there is some legitimate momentum to that end. I wanted to ask you, finally, if there are any particular highlights from the SDG Summit that you think would be noteworthy for this audience. Let me also mention the last part of the stimulus is contingency financing. You know, when COVID hit us, we really scrambled to act. So stimulus says we should put in place measures when we are struck by shocks. Contingency financing is made available immediately to countries who need it. So let me come to other parts of the declaration. I want to emphasize half of humanity, women. The declaration has reinforced and reaffirmed its commitment of the leaders to ensure gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls and to resolve all forms of impediments who hinder women's participation and girls' participation in societies on equal terms. That's a significant statement made at this summit by the leaders. They have also committed to take concrete measures to facilitate access to technologies which are critical 
for energy transition, for food systems, and for digital transformations in society. But let's not see this summit in, is in, in isolation. This summit is also going to add momentum to the financing for development dialogue which will be held on Wednesday. It's also a summit which is laying the foundation for summit of the future, which will be held next year, which also includes changing the international financial architecture. Mr. Assistant Secretary General, thank you so much for taking so much time out of an exceptionally busy day in a very busy week to share your thoughts on this summit and the SDGs in general. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the opportunity. It was a pleasure joining you this morning. All right, big thank you to Naveed Hanif and Elizabeth Cousins for joining me in this special episode of the Global Dispatches podcast. The show is produced by me, Mark Leon Goldberg. It is edited and mixed by Levi Sharp. Tomorrow, we will be discussing the leaders' speeches in our kickoff segment. Among others, we can expect President Biden and President Zelensky to address the United Nations on Tuesday, September 19th. And we will bring you full coverage of those speeches and much more from the 78th United Nations General Assembly. See you tomorrow. Tomorrow.